Second Opinions, chapter 3, verse 6. <laughs> Thou shalt not watch the TV. Well, it's fantastic to be with you tonight. Thank you for this opportunity again. So, yes, as he says, I'm Paul. Um, married to Dawn. 50 years plus in the building trade, which I finished a little while ago. 26 years pastoring a church in the UK. Um, in a little town called Loughborough, Luga Baruga to those. And also, I've got somebody waving at me. Are we okay? It's a bit echoey. Is that all right? Does it sound all right that side? I mean, if it gets too echoey, I'll sing a song. <laughs> yeah, so um, we're now part of... Shall we wait a second? Is it all right? It sounds all right, that side, does it? This side, it sounds like I'm echoey, echoey, echoey. Okay, no, we're okay then. So... So, yeah, so like I said, we're part of uh, a church in the UK now, now in, in a place called Leicester, called One Church, which has five sites around the Leicester area. We're part of a north site, and things are really growing. That sounds a lot better. That's perfect. And things are really growing. God is doing some great things there for us in Leicester. But we do love to come out here to Spain now and again and be able to have the sunshine and come and spend some time with you people here too. I think it's a, a wonderful opportunity for us. We love it. Best time of our life perhaps now, except not for, shall I tell them, not for today. I'm in bad books today. I'm in bad books today. I went, now I'm not sexist in any way, shape or form, but we've got to just kind of, if it kind of breaks the ice a little bit too. I went out for a game of golf today. And I locked my wife indoors. She couldn't get out. She got Jill coming over for lunch. She couldn't get in for a lettuce. So I have repented. And I think she's forgiven me. She's smiling at me now, so that's a good sign. Praise the Lord for that. So anyway, what I would like to talk to you about tonight is something that is very close to my own heart. And I think it comes out of my building kind of background. Um, so when I read scriptures like Nehemiah and Ezra, you know, where they're building things. I love building things. Um, I get really stimulated. So I want to take you just a quick overview of that little book, Minor Prophet, called Haggai. I think it should come up on the screen. I'm going to give you a little overview of this. And I've got five things that I believe God actually wants to say to us. And what I want to say is, I'm also eating off the same plate. Do you know what I mean by that? So I'm eating off the same plate. So Haggai, it comes up there. Okay, brilliant. I'm going to go kind of go through it and speak as I go. Because if I read it all and then start my sermon... I've only got about five minutes. But there are two small um, um, chapters here. In the second year of, the king, of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but you have harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but you are not warm, and you earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in. This, anybody experience that? This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Five times in these two chapters, God says, give careful thought to your ways. Maybe that's a message to us, you know, in our own personal lives. Maybe we just give careful thought to our ways. He's saying... 
Um, go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build the house so that I might take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but you see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why declares the Lord Almighty? Because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with his own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. It's very powerful, isn't it, when you kind of read that. You know, so, so a little bit of history. So we've got um, back in the days of King Cyrus, so we're talking 536 BC, King Cyrus uh, felt stirred by God to build a temple and then sends back a remnant of people to start building. And of course, they had opposition, and for various reasons, the work stopped. And now we've got 16 years later, this prophet Haggai comes into play. So for 16 years, for 16 years, this, this work was going, but it had stopped, and now they were building their own paneled houses, enjoying their own houses, whilst the Lord's house lies a ruin. I don't know whether you noticed there, but the blessing of God seemed to be dependent on how they built the Lord's house. Have you thought, you know, it's almost like no temple, no presence, no blessing. I think that's probably worth the thought. No temple, no presence, no blessing. So, so what's interesting is that he says that I blew away your harvests because you were, you were neglecting the house of the Lord. But then he goes on to say, it's because of you that these things have happened. In other words, it was, it was if you like, um, because of their behavior, it was a consequence of how they lived that it was happening. It wasn't that God was being a horrible God and just blowing stuff away. The consequence of how they lived made a difference to the blessing on their life because of the neglect of the temple. What I'd like us to see, and particularly I'm going to go on Sunday, I think, if you allow me back on Sunday after this. On Sunday, I want to look at Jesus the cornerstone and the house that he's building now that we're all a part of. But I don't know whether you appreciate it, but we are a part of one of the, no, we are a part of the biggest building project ever to have existed in the entirety of the history of the earth. I mean, it's quite profound when you think about it. Jesus is building his church. And we are a part and play our part in what you... Anyway, I don't want to give you Sunday's message before, Friday, before Thursday. So here we go. So because they were neglecting the house of the Lord, the blessing on their own lives had stopped. And it got me to thinking, Paul talks about 2 Corinthians... 2 Corinthians is it 2 Corinthians 9? Sowing and reaping. How often have we heard the sermons on sowing and reaping just before they bring a tithe and offering basket around? <laughs> You know, we, we talk about encouragement, about he who sows greatly, he who sows richly will reap richly, all those kind of things. But this, this one bit of it we don't kind of focus on that I think is worthy of just some thought. It says, he, meaning God, who gives seed for bread and seed for sowing. Well, I sat with that one for a little while. God gives seed for bread and seed for sowing. So it's not that, that God didn't like their paneled houses. It was they were spending all their seed on their paneled houses and was not sowing into the things that God wanted them to sow into. So, you see what I mean? So, so if you think about that, God gives us seed for our bread and seed for sowing. Now, I'm very conscious that, that for myself, I like a game of golf. I play golf a little bit more in England now. But golf is so expensive in Spain. Uh, everybody giving an R oh, for Chris. I'm not sure whether he meant he can't play because of his hand he wanted an R. <laughs> Or whether he was saying I can't afford it because... But, the, but the, biggest, the biggest thing is, you know, when things cost so much and we are living in, a, in an age really where sometimes it feels like our money, our purses have got holes in it, that if we're not careful, it takes a large majority of our income and resource 
to maintain our own paneled houses. And how often then we hear it, we hear it kind of from people, and in pastoral care I heard it many, many times, we tithe or we give or whatever at the end of the month if there's anything left. I think we need to understand that God gives us seed for our bread, and if you're going to go and enjoy your bread, enjoy your bread. God does not mind how you spend your bread, obviously righteously, but he doesn't mind how you spend your bread. If you want to go a game of God, whatever, spend your bread and enjoy life. The bit God's interested in is the bit that he gives us for sowing, whether we sow it or not in the things of God or whether we spend it on our bread, I think that is what's happening here in Haggai. All of their resource, all of their time, all of their energy was being put into their own paneled houses and neglecting the house of the Lord. And I think there's a message there for us today, even in our own time, about how, how we prioritize. Chris obviously prioritizes his telly. But how we, how we prioritize, I think, well, you set yourself up for that one, Chris, I'm sorry. <laughs> So we need to understand, we need to understand that, that God wants a house that he can dwell in and enjoy communing with his people where his people honor him and he blesses them. I just find that a wonderful, beautiful thing that God wants a house where he can be honored in and he can spend that wonderful time with his children and therefore bless them. That's our God. God wants to bless them. But because of their lifestyles, it held back the blessing. I wonder whether in actual fact that can still happen to us today. So it goes on into, um, I'm only going to give a brief overview. So if I go to verse 12, um, let me go to 13. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message of the Lord to the people. I am with you, declares the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant of the people. They came and began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month of the second year of King Darius. Now, a preacher can come in, he can get you whipped up, he can get you stirred up. You know, isn't it great? And then we go home and we feel fired up. I was thinking about this. How often, how often, if I came to you on Friday and said, what did the preacher preach about on Sunday? Am I the only one that goes, oh, I can't remember. I can't remember what it was preached. You know, so, so what, what, to, what to understand, no matter what the preacher says, no matter what I'm saying now, what we need is a revived heart where the Lord himself stirs people up. You're not very stirred. Like, no, I'm not, I've just said I'm not going to stir you up. But we need, we need through the word of the Lord, God himself to stir our hearts into the purposes of God. Because the one thing I am absolutely convinced of is human encouragement lasts for about a week. If that long. Human encouragement is great, but you get that bill on your doorstep Monday morning. It doesn't matter what encouragement you had on Sunday. We need a stirring of the Lord in the building of what he, in the purposes of God, of what he's got for our lives. Amen? Chapter 2. On the 21st day of the seventh month, of the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai, speak to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest, and to, and to the remnant of the people. Ask them, who of you is left who saw the house in its former glory. How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? So, if you go back into Ezra, we're not now, but we've got time, but if you went back into Ezra, there was a time when they lay, laid the foundation of the temple. And there were those older priests and older people who remembered the former glory of the first temple of Solomon before it was destroyed. They, they remember that. And if you read Ezra, it says those people were weeping. They were mourning for that old glory. Yet the young people, 
the people who couldn't remember the old glory, they were like cheers. And it says that you could not distinguish between the shouts of, uh, of, of ex- or the shouts of excitement and the shouts of weeping that could be heard afar off. And he's asking the same question, who can remember the old form of glory? Because there would have been people that were alive in the days of Solomon. And now here we are. And I really felt that God was trying to encourage me to say this. How many of us, because I'm looking around a room where there's a lot of people that are at least my age or a little bit more. Some of you, just to be courteous, might be a little bit younger. How many of you have got your stories of glory days past? I can think of our time at the Beacon Christian Center and go, well, what God did. He did some amazing things. We saw people supernaturally getting saved. Those glory days were wonderful. But what does it look like to us now? And I really felt God was saying, don't live in the past glories because he's got far more glories for us yet to live. He's got far more glories. You know, the preacher on Sunday said to Chris, you don't retire. Do you? you don't retire? No, no, absolutely, Chris. He's not retiring. Um, but if we've got a pulse, God ain't finished with us yet. Now, I may not. I played squash for many years. I played squash with my youngest son a few weeks ago, and it didn't. It was. Ugh. I am not in the prime of my life to play squash anymore. I am not in the prime of my life to plaster the big ceilings. But I am in the prime of my life to do exactly what God wants me to do in this season of my life. Doesn't matter how old you are, you are in the prime of your life to be doing exactly what God has called you to do in this season of your life. It may not look like those days of old, but now and the future is still a time to build. So it goes on to say, after that little challenge. But now, be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua. Be strong, all of you people of the land, declares the Lord, and work. And work. I'm retiring. No, and work. This is what it says, and work, declares the Lord. Now, one of the things I like about this I know you've done quite a bit of your work here on the feasts, you know. On the 21st day, chapter 2 started, on the 21st day of the seventh month. I think the work had been started for about four weeks, and of course the people didn't work every day. Um, Ordinary work on the Sabbath was forbidden. Work uh, on the Feast of Trumpets was forbidden. Work on uh, Yom Kippur was, was forbidden. And finally, work on the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles was forbidden. So they had their time off. But what I want us to see here is the 21st day of the seventh month was the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. These people had been sitting for the last five days, or last week, they have been living outside of their paneled houses, in their gardens, in makeshift shelters, backache, everybody in a hotel and thought, oh, can't wait to get back in, been camping, can't wait to get back in my own bed. These people at the end of this time, but they just couldn't wait to get back into their nice paneled houses. Isn't God's timing perfect to bring a message about comfort in somebody's house? And in this moment, God is bringing to these people, now you know how I feel. You want your own nice house again, I want mine. This was a time where they they were celebrating, they were remembering the time of release from Egypt, they were remembering the wanderings in the desert, they were remembering God's provision, they remember how God looked after them and his covenant and his promises towards them. It was a celebration for a fantastic harvest, but we just read what their harvest were being like. 
And now they're in their gardens waiting to go in their nice paneled houses and God brings this wonderful message to them. How about my house? How about your priorities? How about priorities getting back into working on the house of the Lord that I might have a house where I might dwell, where I might be with my people and where I might bless them. Of course, the last and the greatest day of the feast, Jesus in John, we know the story on the last and greatest day of the feast, stands up in a loud voice. I'll probably go into this a bit more detail on Sunday, on a loud voice. Whoever is thirsty, come to me. Talks about rivers of life. And of course, he's talking about Pentecost. He's talking about when the Holy Spirit would come and live in all flesh. When the Holy Spirit would make the temple and the home in our bodies. Temple, presence, blessing. But of course, it's not just about us. It's about us cum cum together. It's about us together and what is being built together. His house, temple, for his presence, his blessing, to touch the world around us. But the beautiful thing is, every single one of us is a part of that. It's not a consumerism. It's a participation. And the encouragement, no matter how old we are, we've all still got a part to play. Does that encourage you? Does that stir your hearts to believe that God's still got a purpose for you, even at our times of life, that there is still so, so much to be done? I know um, we talk a lot about the Jewish race, the Jewish everything, what you've been looking at, particularly when we look at the world out there, uh, but I think there is just something that's close to my own heart is Gentiles. Gentiles. There's still millions of Gentiles as well that got to be saved. You know, and if, if God is holding Jews back while well, the full amount of Gentiles coming, if we're in the end times, it's more urgent now to get the Gentiles in before, while, while he may be found. And we're a part of that great mission. So what am I saying? What are, have I, have I... So I'm just going to turn that round. God doesn't call us to live in the glories of the past. He's calling us to be building something for the future. No matter how old we are. Amen. Sowing and reaping. What's he giving? What's he putting in your hands? And I'm not talking about finance particularly. I'm talking about your ministries. I'm talking about your gifts. I'm sure that in this house, and maybe tonight, maybe there is, somebody was used a word on Sunday that said ex-ministers. Anybody else here has been in the, what we would call in the ministry in their pasts, maybe there is, there is. And I'm sure there are many, many people that we call in ex-ministers. And I just felt it was the word of the Lord that says we're not ex-ministers. We're not ex-ministers, we're still in the ministry. We're still fathers, we're still mothers to a younger generation to see people come through strong into a new generation. So, you know, how do we do that? How do we get together and start working in a way that can start, start being able to build something so the next generation builds on our shoulders? This is not a waiting room for God. I'm not suggesting I thought it was. Please hear that. <laughs> but the reality is we're, we are in a most exciting time, I believe where we can see many, many people's lives reach for Christ. But my encouragement was, don't live in glorious past. Let's start living in some glorious future. Sowing and reaping what's God placed in your hands. No temple, no presence, no blessing. 
and give careful thought to our ways. And one of the biggest messages I felt God was saying, and it's that for me and Dawn particularly, I know that God said this, finish strong. Finish strong. Don't, don't, let's not walk through that finish line. Finish strong. I believe that there's a blessing of God coming. But it's all hands on deck in this wonderful building program that we're on. Amen. <clears throat> what else have I got to say? What else was it? When we think about the Word of God, Jesus talked about the Word of God being a seed that's planted in our hearts. And he talks about seed being sown on a gravel path, no roots. You know the story, don't you? The parable of the sower. But what he does talk about is the seed that's planted in the good and noble heart. And I think one of the things that, that we need to really appreciate is if we look at Mark chapter 4, Jesus in the explanation of the person with the noble heart, it says, hears the word and accepts it. You see, I'm sorry to take it out on Chris again. He couldn't accept the word about the TV, could he? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you see, he couldn't accept the word. You see, you see, sometimes the word of God can be difficult to receive, can't it? But the person with a good and noble heart, it says, will hear it, will accept it. They'll receive it and accept it. If you go into Matthew chapter 13, Jesus is explaining exactly the same parable. The person with the heart, noble heart, it says, hears the word and understands it. Because if we don't understand it, misunderstanding leads to false expectations. And when false expectations come, lead to disappointments. And then we're going, where's God in all of this? We need to understand it. Luke says that we need to retain it and persevere in it. Right? So if we put all of those three, Jesus' explanation from three different people's gospels there, we've got to hear the word, we've got to accept it, we've got to understand it, we've got to retain it, and we've got to persevere in it. They're the people who bear the fruit 20, 40, 100 so my encouragement as I'm just kind of finishing, because I'd like you to give time a little bit for prayer and to just let the Holy Spirit soak something into us. I don't want it just to be a nice little sermon that you've just heard, a sermon you've heard. What I'd really like is for God to stir our hearts with the word. You've heard something. I'd like you to take it home. I'd like you to digest it. I'd like you to work through Haggai again. Lord, what are you saying to me? I want that word to be sown in here. I want to retain it. I want to persevere with it because I want to bear fruit of what I've just heard tonight. Maybe I'm just speaking about myself, but often I can go into church, sing the songs, have a great time, you hear a sermon, you walk out, and like I say, I do nothing with the word. But if we're going to see the fruit come to pass, we've got to hear it, we've got to receive it, We've got to understand it, and we've got to retain it, and we've got to persevere with it. Then we'll see the fruit of the word happen. Amen? <laughs> Hope this isn't feeling too heavy, because you're just like looking at me like you're... What did he say on Sunday? Smile at me, it would make me feel a little bit better. <laughs> I ought to have started with that. I ought to have started with that. A house of the Lord where God will reside with his people, his presence so powerful, his glory so powerful, the blessing of the, of the people will come out of that. Of course then, if we kind of go on very, very quickly, because we're about done. Now give careful, so it's chapter two, verse 15. Now give careful thought to this from this day on, Consider how things were before one stone was laid on another in the Lord's temple. When anyone came to a heap of 20 measures, there were only 10. When anyone 
went to the wine vat to draw off 50 measures, there were only 20. I struck all the work of your hands with blight, mildew, and hail, yet you did not turn to me, declares the Lord. From this day on, from the 24th day of the ninth month, give careful thought to the day when the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid. Give careful thought. Is there yet any seed left in the barn until now? The vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have not borne fruit. From this day on, I will bless you. Give careful thought to the foundation of the Lord's temple that was laid. Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of this temple. Give careful thought to how we build according to the cornerstone of Jesus Christ in our own personal lives, in how we, we prioritize things, in how we live. Give careful thought to Jesus Christ who is the cornerstone of this building which God will inhabit. He's talking future generation. He's talking millennia. He's talking at the end of time when Jesus Christ will fulfill all things and the glory of that temple will far out seed any glory of any previous temple. It looks as though as you read it, the, that he's talking about the glory of the present house on that day it was restored was going to be greater. But it never was. That was never greater than the glory that was in Solomon's day. In fact, it was destroyed again in the time of the Romans. He's talking future. He's talking about a building we're building now that's going to finish it in eternity that we're all a part of. And I want it just to excite our hearts that we're part of something far greater and far bigger than ourselves. Amen. Thank you for listening to me. I'm going to pray for you if that's okay. <clears throat> Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Touch our hearts, touch our lives with your word. Revive our hearts. Father, in the words that I've used tonight, those that are of my words, let them fall to the ground. But I just pray that the word of the Holy Spirit, just something, whether it's one word that's come out of the night, that would just encourage hearts to build something for eternity, to be part of something and excited again for a future season in the life of this church here. Would you stir our hearts into action? Would you show us the way forward? Would you help us to be builders for the kingdom of heaven? Would you help us to search our own hearts? Would you help us to prioritize? Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. Would you help us to do things in the right order that we might, that we might be part of what you are building rather than just inviting you to come into what we are building? Holy Spirit, lead us, direct us, empower us, equip us, but I pray that your church would go from strength to strength. Here, Father, in Salt Church, it would go from strength to strength. We pray for the younger elements of the church. We pray for the older element of the church. We pray, Father, that you, in the powerful name of Jesus, would, would pull something together that would build something strong into a next generation. And above all, Father, help us all to finish well and to finish strong in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Bless you. <clears throat>